Okay, well, welcome to this Marconi Day meeting here on Zoom for NJARC. Uh, Marconi Day is a international on the air uh, short wave event uh, sponsored by a club in, in, in the UK. And as soon as the virus hit, they yeah, I think so. <laughs> so, uh, uh, but and this and, and Marconi Day is usually observed on the Saturday closest to Marconi's birthday, and today is Marconi's birthday. So, uh, with that, we, we have a, a presentation on Marconi uh, by Jim Duran, followed by Harry Clancer. So, I'm going to turn this over to Jim and I'll let him start his presentation. Go ahead, Jim. Welcome and happy Marconi Day. Uh, the you. presentation you're gonna to see today is uh, an outgrowth of uh, two separate things that were done earlier. Uh, Harry and I gave uh, the bulk of this presentation uh, to a group at the uh, Twin Lights in Navisink uh, to commemorate some of uh, Marconi's activities there. And uh, the, the other part that you're gonna see now that I'm gonna start with um, is the, uh, the beginning of uh, the Radio Technology Museum tour, which uh, most of you have probably already seen, many of you have already given, uh, but this is one version of it. So, um, once upon a time, there was a young lady who lived in a castle and loved to sing. Um, she was not a princess, but she was an heiress. She was heir to the Jameson's whiskey fortune. Her uh, father was um, Andrew Jameson, and his father was John Jameson, who had come from Scotland with uh, Daniel Dewar and uh, Arthur Haig to um, learn how to make whiskey. Now, the, the castle that they lived in is not this one. I've not been able to find a uh, uh, authentic picture or drawing of, of Daphne Castle. This is Ashford Castle that belongs to the, the Guinness family, so it's least in the adult beverage family. And so the, one of the first exhibits we have in the museum is a Jameson's whiskey bottle, <clears throat> empty unfortunately, uh, we don't use it for the entertainment of the, of the visitors or the staff, but it does have this story to tell. Uh, our story begins in Ireland with Annie Jameson, uh, who was age 16 uh, at this time. And uh, has, she's the youngest of five daughters to Andrew Jameson. Uh, only one of her siblings concerns us, Elizabeth Jameson, her older sister, uh, is an incurable romantic and intriguer, which is what makes all of this work. And um, I already introduced Andrew Jameson, their father, and John Jameson. The other person that plays a role here is Lieutenant Prescott, a British Army officer who is engaged to Elizabeth. Uh, keep in mind that this is 19th century, so Ireland as a whole is still a part of uh, the British Empire, still a part of what's now the United Kingdom. So, as I mentioned earlier, um, Annie loved to sing, and she had a beautiful voice, and she won an engagement to sing at the Royal Opera House in Covent Garden in London. Um, unfortunately, uh, the London opera world had an unsavory reputation in those days, um, little better than, than vaudeville, uh, and it was considered quite a loose, promiscuous place, and the um, upstanding Jameson family was not going to allow their teenage daughter to go there. So she pleaded with them and they found another solution. Um, Andrew's role in the Jameson Whiskey Company was he was the international marketer, what we would call him today. Uh, he was the one who arranged to, uh, to sell it and export it overseas. So he had a lot of foreign connections, including a trusted friend and business contact, a banker, um, in Bologna, Italy, which also had a great music school, the Conservatoire. And did my screen just disappear there? It did on mine. Hang on.
You guys still with me? I can't see. Yeah, I'm at Oxesia. All right, I'm going back to the. Okay. Um, so they agreed to let um, Annie go to um, go to Italy, go to Bologna, uh, and she's going to stay with the family of uh, Anthony De Ronoli, who is a, a business colleague of the of the Jamesons, and you know, with his family, and his family includes um, his son-in-law Giuseppe Marconi because um, Antonio had a daughter, Lucia, uh, who died, uh, but not before giving birth to Luigi Marconi. So the Marconis were frequent visitors at the De Rinoli family. And it was love at first sight when, when we saw each other, um, Andy Jameson and, uh, and Giuseppe Marconi fell for each other almost immediately. The 16 year old girl, uh, and the uh, the widower with a child twice her age, uh, but it was a, a true love match and a, and a passionate one, and they agreed to get married. And so, uh, full of excitement and and hope, she went back to Ireland to tell her parents the good news. They were horrified that she and they absolutely forbade her to marry um, a foreigner, a Catholic, uh, an Italian somebody they didn't know, uh, and they said, you're not going back to Italy. So like a dutiful daughter, uh, who was 17 now, um, she spent a year living at home and, and abiding by their wishes. Uh, but her older sister, Elizabeth, uh, managed with the connivance of her British Army officer uh, fiance to facilitate a correspondence between the two young lovers. And so they kept in touch, and the and the romance blossomed. And um, as soon as she turned eighteen, uh, Annie snuck out of the castle with the with the assistance of her sister. And the two sisters took a sailboat. Well, first they crossed Ireland to uh, to Dublin, um, and then they took a sailboat to Wales, and then a series of carriages across Wales and England, and a paddle wheel steamer across the English Channel. Meanwhile. Giuseppe um, had uh, stolen the family carriage and rode across the Alps and met them in France. And they, they met uh, on the beach in, in France and they were married in Bologna. Uh, and even her parents couldn't do anything to resist that. So off she went to Italy. Um, her sister actually uh, went with her. The two of the sisters spent most of their lives uh, in the same place. Uh, but this is Villa Grafone, the, the uh, Marconi family home. Um, they had both this villa and a, uh, a townhouse, a, a palazzo in Bologna. So the, the, the young couple split their time between the two locations. The um, the house plays an important role in our story, too, because this is where Marconi would eventually do most of his experiments. Um, the elder Marconis, Giuseppe and, and Annie Jameson, uh, had a son with a year of marriage, Alfonso. Uh, Alfonso was the, the dutiful uh, firstborn eldest child uh, who was happy to father, follow in his father's footsteps and become a a landowner and gentleman farmer. Uh, and then um, Guillermo Marconi uh, was born on April 25th, 1874. Um, the Marconi marriage was a, was a passionate and mostly happy one, but Giuseppe was a, was a tough father. He was stern, he was demanding. Um, the, the boys were educated uh, mostly at home. Although, because his mother traveled back to the UK frequently, um, Giuseppe, or I'm sorry, Guillermo, um, was educated partly in England and partly in Italy. Um, and so this, um, this unusual arrangement, unusual upbringing, 
uh, lead us to um, an education um, that's sort of um, uh, erratic. He's he's got some some uh, some brilliant ideas and some some fascination with electricity. He was very familiar with the works of uh, Benjamin Franklin and Alexander Graham Bell. Uh, he learned early on how to do Morse code from a neighbor. Um, and, uh, and he was, uh, he worshiped these, these figures, these uh, uh, scientists and businessmen of the time. And he wanted to be wealthy, successful, and famous like them, particularly like Thomas Edison. Um, unfortunately, um, his, the rest of his education was pretty spotty. And so when he tried to take the entrance exams to the University of Bologna, and then later to the Italian Naval Academy, he failed because they weren't particularly looking for somebody with a brilliant background in, in physics and chemistry. They were looking for somebody with a well-rounded liberal education, which he did not have. Um, in a previous edition of this, uh, this talk, somebody asked me uh, uh, about his failure to, to pass the exam, and I did a little more research on it. Um, <clears throat> He failed the entrance exam, but he did well enough that they uh, exempted him from the compulsory military service. So instead of entering into uh, Italian military uh, at 18 to do two years like, like most of his countrymen, um, he was granted the opportunity to enter as an officer, uh, but later on. This enraged his father, who couldn't understand how his son could be smart enough to get into the Naval Academy, but too stupid, or smart enough to become an officer, but too stupid to get into the Naval Academy. <clears throat> so he, as I said, had a fascination with electricity and um, uh, was particularly captured by the work of James Clerk Ma Maxwell, uh, who had essentially working with pencil and paper figured out that electromagnetic waves had to exist. That coupled electric and magnetic fields could travel through space as an electromagnetic wave. Um, as I said, he did this pretty much with pencil and paper. He didn't experiment to see whether his theory was accurate. Um, but it was certainly profound, and it, and it had a great influence on everybody who would come after. Uh, Heinrich Hertz, who was familiar with uh, Maxwell's uh, uh, theories, um, conducted the experiments to prove the existence of the electromagnetic waves. And he, in fact, was able to do that. He, his experiments proved that the magnetic waves exist and were essentially as Maxwell had predicted them. But he, too, did not take the next step and look for a practical use, a practical ex, uh, exploitation uh, for this knowledge. Uh, when he was given an award for his achievement, uh, one of the people present asked him what he thought would be the practical result, the application of his discoveries, and he, he shrugged and said, nothing, I guess. Well, nothing, I guess, was essentially what uh, Giuseppe Marconi expected from, uh, from Guillermo's experiments. He tried at every turn to, uh, to thwart them, to distract him, to, to get him to settle down. Um, and so, um, in order to prove the, the worth of what he was doing, um, Guillermo decided, I'm going one ahead, uh, decided to demonstrate his work, uh, and he replicated uh, Hertz's experiment, essentially a spark transmitter uh, activating a bell on the other side of the room, to show to his father that, you know, if I can, uh, that I can generate um, uh, energy and I can make it travel through space. And his father said, you know, so what? And he said, well, if I can send energy, then I can send information. What he had in mind was being able to use Morse code, with which he was always familiar, uh, to um, have the, the on-off uh, uh, effect of the electricity ring a bell, and eventually uh, operate a, uh, a telegraph key. 
And um, his father was once again, only mildly interested. He said, you know, the bad news is I can see you and I can hear you. This is not a practical invention uh, unless you can transmit to a distance where um, I, can, I can receive the message where I wouldn't ordinarily be able to see or hear you. Okay, so um, keep that in mind and then let's look at why we've gone to the trouble of, of laying all of this out. Why does it matter? Well, Malconi's background matters because he was a British subject. He, Ireland was then a part of the British Empire, which meant he was raised and educated in England and Italy. He was fluent in both languages, and he spoke English with an Irish accent all his life. This would make it a lot easier when he got to England and was trying to explain his uh, inventions and get, um, uh, get support for his experimentation. Uh, it also meant that he would have the time, the leisure, and the money to experiment and to exploit his uh, inventions, but only if he could convince his father. And we've seen how well that was working. And it also meant that any company he would eventually form would be a British company. Um, so all of those consequences matter to us in this, in this story. So back to... Um, Back to Marconi, um, he knows now he has to convince his father by demonstrating that this is a practical invention uh, so he can get his father's assistance uh, to find uh, backers and supporters. He's initially thinking the Italian Navy, the Italian Post and Telegraph, um, but he decides uh, to uh, expand his experiment to, to, to scale it up so that he can um, demonstrate over, over distance and over obstacles that this will work. So Harry, if you'd like to show the, um, show the video clip here, we can see the next stage. Okay. People set out to find the waves predicted by Maxwell's equations. What must have seemed the least promising attempt to harness them is made here, in northern Italy, in the attic of a family home, by 20-year-old Guglielmo Marconi. His process starts with a series of sparks. The burst of electricity creates a momentary magnetic field which in turn generates a momentary electric field, which creates another magnetic field. The energy cycles between the two, propagating an electromagnetic wave. Marconi gets his system to work inside, but then he scales up. He asks his brother and an assistant to carry a receiver across the estate to the far side of a nearby hill. They also have a shotgun, which they will fire if they manage to pick up the signal. has been detected even though the receiver is now hidden behind a hill. At over a mile, it is the farthest transmission to date. Jim, back to you for a minute. Anything to say? So what did, what did we see here? We saw Marconi uh, demonstrating to his father that not only uh, could he uh, send energy over time or over space, uh, it had a practical application. He could send information in the form of, of Morse code uh, out of line of sight, further than you could see or hear. So his father's now convinced, uh, and he helps him try to market this idea 
uh, first to the Italian Navy and then to the Post and Telegraph, without success. The Italian government essentially says, well, we live in a long, thin country, and it's already uh, fully covered by telegraphs. We don't really need this. We don't, we don't see the practical application for it. Uh, his mother steps in again at this point. His mother was always his greatest supporter and fan. And she says, how about if we go to England? I know everybody important in England, uh, and I will get you a letter of introduction. She had a, uh, a family member who was uh, in contact with uh, Priest, who was the, the head of uh, uh, British um, Telegraph or British um, Post and, and um, what do they call it? General Post Office. Uh, and so they decide to go to England. They pack up all his equipment uh, and they cross the channel to England. And uh, Harry, do you want to pick it up from there? I will do. Second here. So, uh, as Jim said, uh, this is the story of from Marconi's earliest days to, to real radio. Uh, we call it wireless to radio, and, and uh, now he's in North America. Here's just a little clip of the things that we're going to be talking about. I'm not uh, really going to spend any time uh, right now uh, telling you about much of this because we'll get to it. But let's try this. There we go. Uh, so he arrives in England and uh, in uh, when he's age 21 and he gets to Dover. Now the first thing that the British customs people did was they took the box of his equipment and they tore into it and basically tore it apart. Uh, but he was undaunted and he was a, uh, a real uh, experimenter. And uh, so the next thing he did, uh, was being being very ambitious. He founded a, a, a company, a radio company, a wireless company, Marconi Wireless and Telegraph. That's the next year. Uh, he did numerous experiments in England, and he got as far as 126 miles. And in the following year, he actually formed also a Marconi International Marine and Communications Company, another company for ship to shore. After all, what are the uses of wireless in, in those days? As, as Jim pointed out, the, the Italians said, we have wired telegraph, we don't need anything else. Well, the uses were ship to shore. You can't drag a cable behind, I mean, you can't drag a wire behind the ship. And... Uh, even though there were international cables, they were very difficult and expensive to use. So to connect con countries together, you also could take advantage of wireless, or so he thought. Following his experiments, uh, he was invited the next year by the publisher of the New York Herald newspaper to use his wireless system to report on the America's Cup race. There was going to be an America's Cup race in, in, at the end of 1899. Uh, and he was asked to come to cover it. Uh, and he went to get some new business with the US Navy. Now here's a brief uh, clip on the cup itself. This was between JP, JP Morgan's American yacht, Columbia, and Sir Thomas Lipton's Shamrock yacht. Uh, so basically it was a, a US and England race, um, probably a grudge race. It was going to be held off Sandy Hook. Now, as you can see from the picture here, the, the, the little map of uh, one of the heats of the race, uh, that's m more than 10 miles off the coast. It's really not visible from land. Uh, so what was he going to do? Uh, he was going to take advantage of the location of the Navisink light, that, which is really the Navisink twin lights, and I'll be talking about it as the twin lights. Uh, and what he was gonna do was to place a, a spark transmitter in a boat positioned on the race course. He was gonna have a wireless receiver at the twin lights and then send the race reports from the twin lights 
to the Herald by Landline Telegraph. Well, first we'll take a look at what a spark transmitter does and is, though, because that's important to our story. As you can see, the damped waves of a spark transmitter transmit a very, very broad spectrum of energy. Uh, in this case, it's uh, from roughly 10 kilohertz to 10 megahertz. Uh, so, there, of course, there was no broadcast band in those days, but if there had been, the broadcast band is only a small part of that expanse. So, you're putting all of that spark energy and spreading it across a very wide band. So let's take a look at Marconi's plan uh, in a graphic here from the Ponce, which was on the course, to the Twin Lights by wireless and to the Herald. Well, the reporting actually was uh, a, a very important thing. The, the race itself was a success. The Columbia won, the US won. And the reporting was also a success. Reports were sent to the Herald via the Twin Lights, by Marconi, for publication within minutes. Now, the New York Times actually complained that it took minutes. Uh, they had a, uh, a kind of a sneering article um, saying it should have been faster. Well, that was then. And then he followed up with a visit to the Navy. He gave special demonstrations to the US Navy, which was very interested in wireless telegraphy, and the performance of his systems was reasonably good except for one thing. The interference was perfect. Every time another Navy ship um, transmitted anything, uh, it just totally scrambled, the, the, uh, as you would expect, uh, just totally wiped out the transmission. That was from uh, Howarth, uh, who wrote the history of communications in the U.S. Navy. Um, at the end of this thing, I'll have a list of um, uh, sources if you want. Well, Marconi offered uh, the Navy his standard terms. His standard terms were he had to lease all equipment from the Marconi company. He was a businessman. He was uh, not strictly technologist. Uh, and his stations refused to interwork with those of other companies. So you had to have Marconi stations on both ends. Well, of course, uh, he refused and the Navy refused. The Navy refused to take any offers. So he went home without any orders. Uh, in 1901, there was another America's Cup race. There was a new, new Shamrock II, and that challenged Columbia to a cup race. Marconi was invited back, this time by the Associated Press, to report the race, but this time there was competition. Lee DeForest, uh, who has his own, um, uh, who was relatively young at the time, and a fellow named Gustav Gehring, who was mostly a stock operator um, and very unscrupulous. Well, what was the result? Interference, once again, was perfect. No messages got through. Howarth describes this one as a radio fiasco, but Marconi was under pressure from his board to look for more growth opportunities, so he went on to what he called the great thing. Now, what is the great thing? Well, his ship to shore work, of course, had been less than 250 miles, but this was going to be transoceanic messaging all the way across the Atlantic. He scheduled a demonstration in December of 1901, and the plan was that it would go from Paldew, which was on the Cornwall coast, to Wellfleet on Cape, Cape Cod, a little over 3,000 miles. Hmm. Uh, here are some uh, pictures of the antenna systems at those locations. Here's Paldew, and here's the Wellfleet antenna. Um, he did engage the services of John Vivian, who was a, um, an English engineer, who said uh, the antenna systems are unstable. Well, of course, he didn't have time to do anything about that at this point. And then you can have a drum roll. On September 17th, 1901, just a few months before the 
test, the transmitting antenna that told you was leveled by a gale. And it was replaced by a smaller antenna, a weaker transmitter, and so on. That was unfortunate enough, but even worse. A few weeks before the test, a storm destroyed the antenna at Wellfleet. He had nothing. So he rapidly began searching for another location in North America. He chose St. John's, Newfoundland, Signal Hill. Uh, the reason for that might be obvious from this picture. There's Signal Hill, here's Newfoundland, which was close to Canada. Uh, here's Signal Hill, only 2,000 miles. He saved 1,000 miles at least. Unfortunately for him, uh, well, here's some current pictures. Uh, here's Signal Hill itself. This is the Narrows that leads out to the North Atlantic. And here, it, here is Signal Hill. This is St. John's. This is Signal Hill. Paul Dew is a couple of, hundred, a couple of thousand miles in that direction. Um, the Cabot Tower, just to give you a sense of scale, uh, is here. That's on top of Signal Hill, right there in that little dot. That's Cabot Tower. So that's where he was going to do his test. Well, he couldn't construct antenna towers there in two weeks. What he did was he suspended the receiving antenna from kites and balloons in a gale, by the way. Uh, here's an image of uh, some of the activity. Here's the equipment he used. A two-stage transmitter at Poldu. Again, remember this is much reduced from the original uh, idea. Um, it had a very low spark rate because he had to get a lot of power in each spark. So he had to let it charge up significantly. The transmit frequency was estimated uh, at about 830 kilohertz. So it's right in the middle of today's broadcast band, AM broadcast band. On the receiving side, his um, uh, makeshift at uh, St. John's at, at Signal Hill was a non-syntonic receiver. That was a word that was used in those days for matching of frequencies. And he couldn't tune the receiver, in other words. His receiver was based on a coherer. If anyone of you know what a coherer is, it's a basically a glass tube with iron filings or something inside, and when a signal um, is applied, uh, mostly the, uh, the filings line up and you get, uh, you, can, you can get current transfer through that. Um, usually they used it with an inker, but, uh, which was mechanically driven, but um, since there would be only very low, low powered signal, um, he used it with headphones to listen for clicks. And it was going to be clicks, if anything, because he had a very low spark rate, coherer oh, receiver, there was not going to be any uh, audible buzz. It was strictly going to be clicks if he heard anything. And he and his assistant, George Kemp, both uh, signed the uh, blog that indicated that, yes, in fact, they had, on December 12th, had heard uh, the signal being sent from Poldu. The signal, by the way, was the letter S. Now, for you, for anyone who knows Morse code, the letter S is three dots. Pretty hard to distinguish that from crashing spark, uh, uh, crashing lightning, and so on and so forth. So, uh, but they claimed they did, and they were congratulated for it. So, did he succeed? Did, he, did it really work? Well, for the 100th anniversary, John Belrose, who's a radio scientist at the Communications Center of Canada, said, look, it, after 100 years, it doesn't matter to us now. Uh, it really started the race. He, Marconi and Fessenden, uh, worked hard after that to achieve reliable transatlantic wireless communications. A few months later, by the way, Marconi did uh, achieve uh, success on the uh, the uh, steamship Philadelphia, which was uh, off uh, the Newfoundland coast, uh, and uh, that was verified. 
Well, let's move on. Here's another aspect of Marconi's life here in the, in the US uh, and, and elsewhere. Uh, wireless became a lifesaver. In 1909, the, SS, uh, the RMS Republic was sunk off of Nantucket. It uh, collided with the Florida. And uh, it happened to, to be equipped with the new Marconi Wireless Telegraph. And it was the first ship ever to issue and succeed in, a, in transmitting a CQD, which was then the distress signal. <laughs> via Spark. And between those two ships, only six people died. Rescuers arrived and they saved 1,500 people. A few years later, there was the Titanic. The Titanic also was equipped with a Marconi wireless telegraph. And in 1912, uh, about uh, two weeks ago, 1912, uh, the Titanic hit the iceberg and transmitted by this time an SOS. That's the Titanic and its foghorn. Uh, the Californian was only 25 miles away. That's less than an hour's sail uh, or at high speed. And the Californian's wireless operator had unfortunately shut down for the night because it was evening. The Carpathian, which was further away, only got there in time to rescue 700 people. 1,500 at this time were lost as opposed to saved. And they were some of the most prominent people in the, in the New York, England, uh, um, Europe uh, uh, milieu. So uh, it was a dis total disaster. So what happened after the Titanic? Well, uh, almost immediately, the 1912 radio law was enacted within a few months. It was a sea change, don't laugh. Uh, in radio regulation, uh, the wireless operators and equipment had to be licensed, but most importantly, all the ship's wireless equipment need to be operated 24 hours a day. Now, something else happened in the aftermath of the Titanic, which may or may not have happened quite the way it was told, but the Marconi Company introduced a new face, David Sarnoff, who was the manager of a uh, station, a small um, Marconi receiving station in Wanamaker's store in New York, and received um, reports and signals from the, uh, the, the area. And, um, uh, and lots, lots of things have been claimed, but the point is Marconi, who had started as an office, uh, Marconi, uh, Sarnoff who had started there as a, for Marconi as an office boy just a few years earlier, was very ambitious and was already a manager of a station uh, just at the age of 20. So we'll get back to him. Right now, of course, the other side, the, the, the great thing had been expanding. Wireless worldwide communication was expanding. By 1913, a number of high-powered wireless stations were being built in the New Jersey, New York area. On Sable, Long Island, Telefunken was building a station for the German government, or for Germany anyway. And in Tuckert in New Jersey, OMAG, which was a German company, had been building a station for CUTT, which was a French company. Unfortunately for CUTT, the company Universal Telegraph and Telephony, uh, Unfortunately for them, the First World War in Europe began before HOMAG turned the property over to the French. So that too was a German station. Uh, here are some uh, images of those stations around that time. Here's Seville and here's Tuckerton. Um, magnificent piece of equipment, it's an 860 foot tower. Uh, here's, for example, you, you, to, to give you an idea, Here's a, an anchor block uh, holding the cables of the tower. And if you want to see what that's like, here's me standing next to it a couple of years ago. Uh, you can see that anchor block is a significant chunk of concrete. No wonder they haven't taken them away. Uh, the tower, of course, is long gone. Anyway, there was another company also building stations in New Jersey. That was Marconi. 
which was a British company. So here's an image of the New Brunswick Marconi station. Uh, it, it, and I don't know if you can read this because it's kind of um, dull, but uh, it employed 13 towers, 400 feet tall, uh, not 860, but 400. Uh, the power was a 300 kilowatt spark transmitter. And where is it? Well, here's where it was. Uh, if anybody of you know where, where the uh, river is, and uh, this is actually Franklin Township, I think, uh, here's JFK Boulevard, and here's Easton Avenue, and the black rectangle is approximately where this image was taken. Uh, Unfortunately, if you go and look today, what you'll find is one remaining Marconi cottage, which is where the chief engineer of the place were, lived, and a sign. That's all that's left. If you go to Belmar, oops, uh, you may see a little more because the Marconi station was the New Brunswick and Belmar combination. Here's, here's the Belmar location, and all of these ellipses are original Marconi buildings. Uh, the powerhouse, the Marconi Hotel, the two, two of the Marconi cottages, and the operations building down by the river. Um, the, the antenna towers, unfortunately, are long gone. Well, here are New Brunswick and Belmar, and why? Because Marconi was planning to build, make a business out of putting stations all around the world and being able to transmit information all around the world, competing with cable company, undersea cable companies, and so on. Um, so the two in New Jersey you have just seen. Now, why did he use two Marconi stations at each location? Well, here's the reason. You saw and heard about interference among spark transmitters. So at each location, he built separate transmitting receiving stations, duplexes, he called them. And here's the uh, image from, uh, uh, borrowed from uh, Bucher's book on how that arrangement was done. Uh, the transmit and receive station, for example, New Brunswick and Belmar were about 30 miles apart. On the uh, British side, the Carnarvon, Carn Carnarvon and, and, and Towen and Wales were about 50 miles apart. Now to prevent transmitted energy from um, blocking the receiver, there is also a, a scheme with balancing out antennas on each side, uh, which was relatively successful. Uh, why did Marconi do this? Because as I said, he wanted to be in business. He wanted to be able to have his stations transmit at high speed, 100 words a minute, uh, in both directions. And uh, this was his goal. But unfortunately, in August of 1914, the Great War began in Europe. On the very first day, the undersea cables from Germany to the rest of the world, or at least to the, to the Western Hemisphere, were cut by the British. So wireless became critical to them. Now, in 1914 and 15, at the, the first year of the war, all wireless stations were taken over by the US Navy, uh, especially Savo Long Island. I want to comment on that. Uh, Savo Long Island was uh, operational, as I told you. It was a telephone station. And there was a New Jersey radio amateur named Charles Apgar who uh, listened to that station and became suspicious. So he actually recorded on wax cylinders some of the uh, messages sent from that station and discovered that buried in between the messages and in the messages were other messages which seemed to be directed toward U-boats out in the Atlantic. Oddly enough, uh, they said things apparently like uh, when convoys would be leaving and where and so on. Uh, 
he took those messages down to Washington and um, the government uh, was very, U.S. government was very interested in that since the U.S. government was a neutral. Anyway, as I said, the stations in uh, the, the wireless stations were all taken over by the U.S. Navy, including the Marconi station, uh, but especially uh, the German station. Now, in 1917, the U.S. entered the war, so we were no longer a neutral. Uh, at that time, GE, which was working on a continuous wave generator instead of a spark transmitter, the Alexanderson alternator, installed a 50 kilowatt continuous wave alternator at New Brunswick. And the next year, early in the year, it was replaced by a 200 kilowatt alternator. Uh, an advantage of alternators, uh, well, continuous waves versus um, damped waves, uh, is that they are both powerful and efficient. You remember this. It was no longer uh, damped waves creating a very, very broad band. Instead, uh, the alternator, here's an image of it, uh, was a continuous wave machine when it was keyed on, uh, transmitting really and it had very good speed control, by the way. Very, really, one one frequency, and even when you keyed it, you st you you got smaller, much smaller sidebands. So you almost all the power was concentrated where you wanted it. Uh, that had some impact. In 1918, in January, in fact, the uh, offer of the U.S. the 14 points from President Wilson. Were sent, was sent to Germany from the New York station, actually a New Brunswick station, actually using the New Brunswick station, which was targeted at Neuen, which was considerably further away than, uh, than Wales. But it was very effective. Uh, others were listening too, other people in Europe. Apparently, you could go around parts of Europe and hear the 14 points basically repeated by other people than the German government. Well, negotiations were continued throughout that year, and finally, in November of 1918, there was an armistice. Now, the Navy Department did not want to relinquish control of the wireless, of the wireless stations. <coughs> However, uh, it was demanded, and finally, in June of 1919, uh, Congress defeated a bill that would have maintained control uh, in the hands of the Navy. So what happened? Well, of course, the Marconi company was British, but the U.S. didn't want to relinquish patent rights to foreign companies, and they certainly didn't want to give away the patents to the alternator, which would, at that time, uh, before vacuum tubes were really in their heyday, was the finest and most powerful transmitter in the world, transmitters in the world. Uh, so. In 1919, the Navy Department uh, just um, suggested to Owen Young, who happened to be chairman of the General Electric Company, that GE make some arrangements for the formation of an American radio company. By the way, Owen Young had been in President Wilson's cabinet during this war, so they, they were known to each other. So GE, it was suggested directly to GE that he do it. And RCA, Radio Corporation of America, was formed by General Electric and Westinghouse, AT&T, and the United Fruit Company. Others were eventually involved and so on, but this was the beginning. So circumstances and the government compelled the Marconi Company to sell all U.S. properties to RCA, and that was the end of American Marconi the beginning of RCA. <clears throat> now, the reason, uh, you know, people wonder whether there was a, it was a fair trade. Well, uh, according to one of the, one of the books, uh, Aitken's book on, called The Continuous Wave, um, there was some bickering going on, but the British Marconi actually got uh, a very good price for their the stock shares that in American Marconi that they sold. So uh, it was not a forced sale in that sense. It was a forced sale, but not financially forced. 
So what are some of the assets that were transferred in this trade? Well, of course, the wireless stations in Belmar and New Brunswick, which you saw before. Uh, there were also a pair of stations in California, Bolinas and Marshall, which were transferred to RCA. Those had been used to transmit to Hawaii, transmit and receive from Hawaii as part of the round the world um, girdle. There was a manufacturing facility that Marconi had in Eldin, uh, which is actually in, near Roselle Park, in Roselle Park, I think. Uh, though that was transferred to General Electric, which of course was a principal in RCA. And a third thing happened. Separately, David Sarnoff also transferred to RCA. After all, in seven years from his days as an op uh, manager of that station in New York to the end of the Marconi company, uh, he had risen to become head of Marconi's commercial department. He was on his way up and very ambitious. What was happening after the First World War? There was a new business being considered, radio broadcasting. There had been lots of experiments uh, before 1920 and in 1920. Uh, they called it dancing by radio. They called it lots of things. Uh, there were experiments in New York and Chicago and California and Montreal, Wisconsin, I think in Iowa. Uh, there were experiments in lots of places, including in New Jersey. The AT&T ship to shore telephone experiment station at Deal Beach uh, had begun experimenting with broadcasting as well. When they weren't experimenting, they put on Victrola records and played them for the general public, whoever could listen. Uh, in Asbury Park, there was an enterprising uh, man who had uh, been renting roller chairs on the boardwalk there, and uh, he fitted them out with radio receivers. Just a kind of an interesting little sidelight. Now, by the end of 1920, in fact, in November of 1920, commercially licensed broadcasting began. Uh, it, it's attributed generally to station KDKA, which is in East Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, which was built for Westinghouse by employee Frank Conrad. Now, Frank Conrad worked for Westinghouse. He was amateur radio 8XK. Uh, and uh, this uh, here is Conrad's house and Conrad's garage where he started working. Eventually, KDKA was built on the roof of the Westinghouse Manufacturing Building in Pittsburgh. But let's get back to Sarnoff since I promised that we'd talk about him a little bit. Why is Sarnoff going to RCA so important? Well, when he was at Marconi, in 1916, he had proposed something called the Radio Music Box. Now, lots of people know about this. Basically, it was talking about what radio broadcasting would be with radio. There were, there were wired broadcasts uh, on, on telephone networks, but he had proposed it, that it be done um, by radio. Uh, Marconi Company was not interested. They were strictly interested in um, transmission of commercial messages. Uh, and in fact, when RCA began, that was officially what RCA began to do. However, Marconi had other, I mean, uh, Sarnoff had other ideas. In 1921, when he was general manager at RCA, he arranged the first big broadcast, which was uh, one of those fights of the century. Jack Dempsey, the heavyweight champion, and Georges Carpentier, a French uh, challenger, uh, were boxing in Jersey City, and this was broadcast before there was, really was much broadcasting. Um, later that year, soon thereafter, in fact, might have been earlier, um, he also caused the deployment of radio station WDY at Aldine, uh, which, as we said, was a GE RCA location. Uh, that was the first licensed broadcasting station in New Jersey. In 1926, when he was at RCA, he founded, he caused the founding of NBC, the National Broadcasting Company, the first large chain or radio network. By 1930, 
uh, after being with RCA for 10 years, uh, he became chairman. And RCA and NBC became really dominant in broadcasting. A few years later, uh, he uh, discovered his longstanding dream could, was, was possible. He introduced electronic television at the New York World's Fair. Just recently, I was at a, uh, went to a talk by Bruce Belanger down in Maryland, uh, actually, again, a Zoom talk. Um, and he pointed out that the other manufacturers were very upset by this because standards hadn't been agreed to, nothing worked together, and so on. Uh, well, the war came along, the Second World War, and um, uh, put electronic television as a public broadcast, uh, as a broadcasting uh, opportunity um, in, in the back burner. But uh, eventually, uh, this is uh, one of the things that drove um, the post-war uh, TV boom. Uh, so why is Sarnoff important? Because he probably was one of the most important people in, in um, what became a major American uh, business, radio broadcasting and television broadcasting. But let's get back to Marconi. In 1922, oh, I, I had not mentioned, in 1909, he received the Nobel Prize, he and Braun from Germany, uh, for physics. But in 1922, he received an award from the Institute of Radio Engineers, the IRE. Uh, in his speech, um, here is what he said. A ship could radiate or project a beam uh, coming across a metallic object. It would be reflected back to the receiver. To reveal the presence and bearing of the other ship of fog or thick weather. Well, of course, that's radar. Uh, obviously, he's not the only one who thought of this. Um, a few years ago, we had a uh, session with his daughter, though, and uh, she uh, brought this up as one of his real contributions, this, this idea of radar. Uh, but by 1939, some years later, as predicted by him and others, radar had really arrived. Here's a picture of radar being in experiments and then being installed uh, at a familiar location. We've come full circle here. This photograph is the Navisync Twin Lights. So it was Marconi's first visit, and uh, here we are. One of his predictions uh, happened there. So I'm going to cut it off here uh, and thank you from the New Jersey Antique Radio Club. And um, here is the list of references. And I can, you know, if anybody's interested in any of these things, I can, of course, give it to you. Um, but for now, that's it. And we're back in the real world. Okay. Harry, thank you, Harry. And Harry, uh, how was that? Uh... How, at the twin twin lights, how was that received by the public? Well, the public that was there received it very well. They really enjoyed it, uh, and had, some people had some really good impressions. The problem is it wasn't advertised very well, and we had a small crowd. Well, that's too bad because it's such a great, great showing. Really, you guys did such a great job of this. A lot of research. Well, at that uh, at that in that case, we had two spark transmitters. And we demonstrated interference. Uh, it really happens. <laughs> anyway. Well, again, thank you. Say, I'll say a few more words about International Marconi Day. Uh, early last year, uh, through, the, through the efforts of Bill Zakowski, we got a, um, uh, a club radio license. Uh, for the club and the museum and got the call W2RTM. And then we got invited to participate in International Marconi Day, which is done with stations at Marconi sites. Of course, we're a Marconi site. Only problem was we didn't have a radio station. So we went down there with four or five people and we threw up a station, got it going, and uh, it's still there and it worked pretty well. Uh, I'm going to call on uh, Neville Greenow to 
give us a quick rundown on last year's Marconi Day and uh, our reasonable success for an early uh, an early start in that area. Go ahead, Neville. <laughs> well, all right, I'll uh, give it a little try here from what I can remember. Uh, yeah, there, the Bill and a bunch of others, and you, uh, Al, uh, we all went down there and uh, the day before and got some antennas working. And uh, then uh, I guess when the thing started, it was uh, had a fairly good crowd hanging around the uh, transceiver that you that you have there that you had lent to the to the setup. And uh, I guess by the end of it, uh, we had worked some eighty or ninety different uh, different folks and. Uh, uh, had, a, had a lot of fun, and we did manage to contact one or two other Marconi uh, locations. I can't remember exactly which ones, but as I recall, we did manage to get to the one up on Long Island, and uh, we heard one other, several others, but only worked one other one, and I don't remember where that was at, the, at this moment. But uh, it was certainly a fun thing, and uh, uh, Al, I think you worked up a QSL card, and uh, don't know how many requests you got for that. But uh, to slightly change the topic here on my little uh, thing here, uh, I don't know if it's possible to make that full screen. This may be RCA's logo as of roughly 1923 uh, for their their transmitter, tra uh, high power and low power transmitter operation. It says Radio Corporation of America, and inside the globe it says Worldwide Wireless. Uh, this is taken from the instruction book for a, let's call it an amateur, but uh, we won't admit that folks were doing pirate radio with this uh, 1923, 1924, 10-watt transmitter that I have. And someday this is going to end up at the museum. Uh, I had brought it many years back to one of the... Uh, show and tells and it's a it's a fun old fun thing to look at i have not yet succeeded in actually getting any rf power out of it simply because i don't have enough number 10 tubes to uh, get anywhere with it so al uh, back to you okay well i think we could maybe find some number 10s and uh get you can get you get that thing going okay thank you neville and um uh the other piece of news here is uh uh, AWRL Field Day by W2RTM has been officially approved by uh, by InfoAge. Uh, InfoAge, however, is confused about which weekend it is, but uh, it's the the the, the fourth the fourth full weekend in uh, in in June, which is the 27th. So uh, that's the story from here. 